One of the pleasures of having a lectureship is the opportunity to hear the preaching of various men. And uh, I'm pleased at this time to come and hear one of our students. We won't take all the credit for his good preaching, but uh, he's been a student here for several years. And uh, Brother Martin, Brother Richie Martin, and uh, I guess that's River Rouge, Mi 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 Michigan, yes, and married Lorraine on, on December the 30th, 1975. So you've been married, uh, uh, we've been married three, a week longer than you because we got married on the December the 23rd. Okay, ours was 1966, oh sorry. Uh, they have three children like we do. He's retired from the military and he, after 24 years in the military, he received an Associate of Science degree from Vincennes University. He is presently a student at our school here and uh, at the Barnes congregation here. He's now serving as a minister for the church in Paul's Valley, one of the congregations in Paul's Valley. He has been preaching for them for three years. And I'll say one thing about uh, Richie. Richie is a man who loves the Lord and a man who is, has a good heart. And he's a lot like Nathaniel. His heart is good. And I, I think that he will do great things and will continue to do great things for the Lord. And I would ask you, Richie, at this time, come and preach to us God's word, if you would, please. Good evening, church. I appreciate it, Brother Marion, being so nice and kind. Uh, it's just been a pleasure here that uh, since I've been at Barnes and uh, to know that God produced such good folks that you can learn from and teach from and that you can carry it on to someone else. Uh, I just want to thank Barnes here for all the good work that they do. And uh, that, you know, you socialize with folks that uh, you want to be like and you want to fellowship with. And I, I just have a good time here every time I get here. And I tell folks all the time about Barnes Church and how good they teach and how friendly they are. And uh, it's just a pleasure. And it, and it rolls over and spills over into my life as a preacher. And I just want to thank Barnes at this time that how much I appreciate what they do here and all the good folks that I met. So enough of the accolades, let's get into the lesson. <sighs> uh, why the Church of Christ are not growing at the rate as in the early years. We want to take, uh, to think about why the churches are not growing. We need that spiritual growth that we once had in the Lord's church today. And uh, this very important for the future of the growth of the church. The growth is development or in uh, improvement towards a goal called maturity. We need that maturity. You know, you go out and you visit a lot of churches and you look around and you speak to them and you think in your mind, Oh, why this church is so small, but it's a huge building. Uh, the growth and development is when one is born again as a child of God, he's spiritually immature at the time. We need to teach those folks. It's all about our attitude. Each and every one is about the attitude that we have. When one is born again as a child, he's spiritually immature. When time passes, the Christian should develop qualities and abilities which the Bible says characterizes the mature. A congregation must uh, mature as individuals themselves. Many scriptures decide, describes the need to grow and mature in spirituality. Look at Ephesians 4, 14 and 15. It says that when henceforth be no more children, toss to and forth, and carried about with every wind of doctrine 
by the slight of man and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him all things, which is the head, even Christ. You know, you, you look at folks and you, you wonder why churches don't grow. It's because the immaturity they have. They don't understand what the Bible says. They don't even bother to look anymore, our young folks. And we wonder why our church don't grow. To have an attitude as an individual Christian, if you are growing in the word, show show the folks that you teach will grow. And if you teach your children at home, the same thing you learn in church, they will grow too. There wouldn't be any immaturity that we have. They will have that attitude that I want to stay and I want to learn about what the Lord has for me. Because if I do have applied in my life, how can I really grow as a Christian? You will never grow. You don't ever pick up the word. So many young folks as parents don't feed their world, the word to their children. They let that world teach them. And we lose them day by day. And it's sad that we, we have to see that in life. It says, be no longer children, but grow up in Christ. 2 Peter 3.18 says, but grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. You know, if our parents do not grow in the Lord's word, how can they feed their children? How can they teach them? Because if they don't teach them, the world surely will teach them. It says we have to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord. You know, the Thessalonians grew exceedingly in their faith. It says in 2 Thessalonians 1 and 3, it says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your Faith groweth exceedingly, and in the charity of every one of you, all toward each other abound. You know, they really grew in Thessalonica for, with one another. You got to have that love of God, that thirst for God, that you want to change your life. A lot of folks just come to sit on the pew, don't ever look into the Word to try to change their lives. Paul prayed for their love to abound more and more. Philippians 1 9, he says, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Many problems result when members fail to grow. Some go back to the world, others cause strife because of ignorance and become. Stumbling blocks because irregular attendance and worldliness or indifference. That's how our church become with more and more problems. We start looking at one another with an evil eye, still the love of God. Then we start separating. Then we start backbiting because that love of God is not in them. But if you Raise your children with the love of God in you. You won't have that kind of problem with each other. Because one thing, that love cover all that in your life. Concerning spiritual matters, Christians must want to grow, want to change, want to have a kind of heart that God can change and form in their life. First Peter 2 and 2, he says, as newborn babes, Desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. You got to want to de desire that kind of milk. You got to want to change your life. Because when we just want to be on milk as a babe, it is not our goal in life just to be on milk. You got to want to get up off of milk and get on the sincere word. A lot of Christians do never change when they walk through the doors. We are born babes so we can grow up and be productive and useful in church. 
We just can't sit on the pews and think the preacher ought to do all the work. We got to want to do the work as well. When we just want to be on that milk, we got a problem with ourselves. One of the conditions of being a child of God is repentance as well. One must determine to turn from sin and go to work in God's vineyard. That's another problem in our church. We'll come on Sundays and, and pray and sing and, and listen to the preacher. But to the rest of the week, we'll live like another person. How can you wear two hats in God's church? If you don't ever want to repent, you'll never change your life. You'll sit there and do the things over and over in your life. Then one must want to bring forth the fruits of repentance. This will lead us to grow and improve in God's work. Otherwise, we don't. We will not accomplish our purpose for becoming children of God. We will never change. Jesus set an example for us, and we should follow in his footsteps. 1 Peter 2.21 says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his footsteps. Even in Ephesians 2.21 he says, In whom all the building fitly framed together grow unto an holy temple in the Lord. We got to want to fit our lives as Jesus fed his. We got to want to be the kind of Christian that God already laid out long before the world ever formed. We got to have an attitude about ourselves. We should ask ourselves, don't I want to grow up to be spiritually strong like Jesus? You got to ask yourself, how can I change my life? I want to change my life to be like Christ. But you got to have an attitude. You got to change your attitude about life and about Christ. You can't just want to just come to church just to come. Because if you change, your family will change. Because it's in you. It's the way you live and form and move in this world. Because you got Christ in you. You want to have that attitude. It's not all about getting things in life and having things in life. It's about living like Christ wants you to live. You know, once you change your life about Christ, you live a life every day. When you lay yourself down, when you raise up in the morning, you have that song in your heart. When you meet folks, they'll say, you change. They see that light in you. You don't see it, you don't feel it, but they see it. Because you're letting God change your life. It's all the way you live and how you have that attitude about the love of God. You gotta have that thirst if you don't ever have that thirst, you won't change your life. Now my body is, scriptures show the need for nourishment in your life. Christians was rebuked for not growing as they should have because they had not studied. Time and again, members fall away or are spiritually starving because they do not eat properly. You know me, I like a good steak. I like, I, I like some some nice uh, string beans, and uh, I like uh, the bread to go with it, and a, a good potato. You know, as Christians, we ought to want that kind of food. Because Hebrews 11, 5, 14 says, of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. But when for the time ye ought to be teachers, yet have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belong to them that are full of age. Even those whom, by reason of use, have their senses exercised, discern both good and evil. I, I like meat. I, I like a good steak. 
But the Lord says you can't live on milk and expect to grow in a full age of life. You got to want that taste, that thirst for a good steak and all the fixings that go with it. That's the Lord's word. You want to feed that spirit because you want a progression in your life that you got poured toward the Lord and not towards the world. Folks get that confused. They think they step outside the doors of the church and they start living like the world. You know, the Bereans was able to determine whether the truth was taught because they searched the scriptures daily. We need regular nourishment in our life every day. Acts 17 and 11, he says, these were more noble than those in Thakonica. And that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. You know, he says, readiness of mind. If you're not ever ready, really ready, and thirst for that word, you won't be able to teach anyone. Psalms 1 and, 1 and 2, he says, meditate on God's word day and night. Day and night. I, I don't get enough of the word because I want God to change me from what I was into where I'm at now and into the future. I need that change in my life. I don't need what the world has for me. If you check out the world now, it's going worse and worse every day that we see the news. They, they're passing laws that not ought to be. And see, when I see our kids and our grandkids see that, they think they ought to be like that. But the Lord says different. I want to change my life. I want to change my children's life. I want to change the people life that I meet. Because I want to live by the word and not about the world. It's not about the world. It's about what the Lord has for me. Because whenever the Lord come and knock on my door and say, Brother Rich, you're ready. I want to be ready. I want to be watchful. I want to be patient for the Lord. It's not about the world. <coughs> the world is the enemy to the Lord and we know it. Psalms 119 and 47 says, And I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. Psalms 119, 95 to 99, he says, The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandments is exceedingly broad. Oh, how I love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou through thy commandments has made me wiser than my enemies. For they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. For my testimonies are my meditation. We got to meditate on the Lord's word. It's not all just about reading the word and putting the book down. It's about reading it and meditating on it. As, as my brother Marion says, chew it a while. And study it. Let it marinate on you so you have it through and through. And then you know. Because the way I see things in life now, all you have to do is go to a grocery store and see how children are running rapid. They have no respect for our elder. They have no respect for you. They would run over you. They would try to do bad things to you. When I was growing up, if you ever do a bad thing to an elderly person, that'd be your last. You gotta raise children all right. The Lord says, do not ever spare that rod. You'll be in trouble. That's why you got to teach your children about the Lord. Joshua 1 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and thou shalt uh, make it observant to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. I want to have good success with my kids, I want to raise them up right. I want them to respect everybody. I want them to, most of all, love everybody in the world. Because that's the way God wants it. Because I want them to see the, the world as the Lord sees it. 
not like the world sees it. I want them to have that spirit that they can really grow in the Lord and feel good about themselves. It's so many children are committing suicide today. So many that we're losing. You see more short grades out in the grades like than you see long ones. So many of our children we're losing in this world because they don't have a foundation to fall on and to get up on. But see, when you're raised up in the Lord, you can get up when you fall. You can't get up when you don't have nothing to get up on. So our children should be raised up in the Word. So many times that we pray that we, when our children leave the nest, that they be all right. You know, when you raise your children up in the Word, I don't worry about them like I used to. Because I know the Lord will take care of them. When you don't have that sh sincerity about the Lord, you have problems. Children and adults need physical food regularly and get very upset without it. But are we content to go for days at a time without feeding on God's word? You know, if I miss one day, I'm mad. Can you imagine folks that had never ever come to the Lord and never fed on God's word? They are starving to death. Do we make us use of our opportunities in the church to provide nourishment when we get a chance? Every opportunity you get, take advantage of it. I never cease to amaze me when the church provides spiritual feasts and members choose to do other things. Oh, well, I can't make the church on Wednesday. Well, I got to go on town on Sunday. I won't see you for a couple of weeks. They make excuses when they want to do other things. We don't miss a meal if we can't help it, though. We'll get that. Why would you want to miss God's meal in your life? You know, teaching of God's word, we need spiritual food from God's word only. A child cannot grow physically without proper food. Good parents are concerned about proper nutrition in their life. They want the children to eat what is good and not bad for them. We are, to uh, we are to touch by pictures of children starving when we see them on TV, of poverty. Most children want nourishment in their life. Babes cry for food. Once as a child, I got so hungry I cried and my mother felt really bad about that. Even adults knowing we need food and don't like to go along or go long without it. We want it every day, regularly, seven times a day. You know, Matthew 4.4, 4, he says, Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's what you ought to feel about yourself when you look around in the church. You just can't live on food. You got to live on every word of God's mouth. You know, we're so sad that churches today, they water down the gospel, or they'll pick and choose what they ought to not uh, preach about. You know, you got to preach the whole word of God to get the full picture. It's the same thing at your house. You know, children mimic what they see at their own home, and they raise their own selves up on that. If they don't ever see you pick up God's word or put God's word in them, then that's the way they're going to do when they get out in the world. They won't bypass it and go straight to someone else to teach them how to live. And how they live will be pretty desperate of how they turn out in life. But if you raise your children right in life, you ain't ever got to worry about how they're going to fall or get up in life because they got the Lord. And in this United States, it's sad that we're falling away from the Lord day by day, year by year. And then you look at your TV and you look at that trash they have on TV. Where did they get that from? Why? Because they have drifted away from the Lord and uh, operating on the, on the whole world. And the world does not care about how us as Christians live, see things, and we move around in the Lord's word. We can change it though. You know, Ephesians 4.15 says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Matthew 5.6 says, Blessed are they which do hunger 
and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. When you got that thirst in your heart, you want to live a righteous life. And you want everyone around you to live a righteous life. Our, our desires of the spiritual blessing must be earn, earnest, though all desires for grace are not grace. Yet such a desire as this is a desire for God's own raising. And he will not forsake the work of his own hands. The merciful are happy. We must not only bear our own afflictions patiently, but we must do all we can to help those who are living in misery. We must have compassion on the souls of others and help them. Pity those who are in sin and seek to snatch them out of the burning fires of hell. We got to want to do that. No, it, it really hurt me to see folks living in that way outside of Christ when we know we can save them. Just give them a word of the Lord and tell them what they're going wrong at. You know, a man will go 75 years wrong until you show him where he's wrong at. We got to want that, just have that desire. So you won't have that thirst and that drive and that rashness in your heart. You'll let them go ahead and drift away. It's the same way you see your children. You want your children to be right, live right, be right, love right. But we don't ever teach them or bring them to the Lord. We're going to have a sorrowful life. Many sorrows will attack them. I'm thinking I'm running out of time. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> Jesus made a comment in Matthew that we are all familiar with. Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Even in 1 Timothy uh, 3 and 2, he says, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. 1 Timothy 4, 11, these things command and teach. Teach. That's what you keep hearing, teach. Not just sit on the bench, but actually teach your children. The problem with some families, they don't teach nobody. They just come home with their homework, boom, and gone, and that's it. Nothing about God's word. You know, uh, my mom, she uh, used to sit me down on Saturdays. She said, son, I should get mad at you. Son, you need to learn these verses. Not just read them. No, memorize these verses. Because the next time I ask you, you're going to memorize it and tell me what they say. You know, that was a challenge for me. I thought, why she want me to do that? But then I got to thinking, let me go and do it, see if I can do it. And you know, if you really try, you can do that. Because not only do you remember, but it's on your heart. When the word is on your heart, then you can actually speak a word of truth to somebody. But if you don't have nothing on your heart to speak, how can you save a soul? You need to have that on you. Live it. It's not something that is a rocket science. Does Brother Mary know about science? It's about the word of the Lord. How you live your life. Your life don't change just because you leave the church. It's the way you live anyway. It's the way we're trained up in the world. It's the way we live and breathe every day. We live this Christian life and breathe it. That's the good part about it. And it says it's hard to live a Christian life. If you are tired of doing wrong, <coughs> then straighten up your life and live right. Then it become easy. Then you can help somebody. We need to be spiritual teachers. First Timothy, second chapter. And 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. That's what it's about. We as Christians must teach the truth and truth. First John 2, 27, he says, but the anointing which ye have received of him abide in you. 
and by ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. You know, our Lord Savior when teaching in, in Galilee as well. Matthew 4.23 says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases among the people. You know, when your heart is open to the word, wisdom starts right there. Mark 6, chapter 6, 34, he says, And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, and was moved with compassion toward them, because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. You know, even in Luke chapter 4, 15, he says, and he taught in the synagogues, being glorified of all. You know, it's all about teaching. It's not, it's not all about sitting on a pew. You know, if you got the love of God in your heart, you will want to teach. You want to get up out of that pew and say, I got some business to do. I got something to do that God needs me to do. I want to be a part of the Lord's church. I want to change things. I just want to sit here on the pew. It starts at home. Teach your children, grandchildren. Come in church and you'll be a part. What do I need to do in church? Ask them, what can I need to do? I want to be a part of this thing. I want to change things around. Because I'm tired of seeing things. I'm tired of seeing the church without our folks. People getting up and leaving. Once you're a part of the church, you'll want to stay. You want to change. <clears throat> I don't want to take up too much time. I know I'm wearing my time out. But I got seven minutes left. I'm not cutting it close. You know, we have examples in the Bible how we should be. Ezra 7.10 says, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the Lord, the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel's statutes and judgments. Even in Ezra 7.25, he says, And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thy hand, set magistrates and judges, which thou may judge all the people, that are beyond the river and all such as know the laws of thy God and teach ye them that know them not. Even the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8, 2 through 8, he says, Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And I'm going to jump down a little bit. Ezra did three things. He prepared, he studied, he practiced, applied his knowledge to his own, and he taught. That's not hard to do in the Lord's church. We can do those things. Jeremiah 9, 24, he says, But let them that glorify glory in this, that he understandeth and knowledge me, that I am the Lord who has exercised loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, said the Lord. The Lord is delight when you study and teach and prepare yourself, practice. The Lord looks down on that and he's happy. I want to please the Lord in my life. And I want everybody else to be the same way. Many Christians, when they are newborn, are full of fire. Telling everyone they come in contact about the blessing and the good news saves people's souls. You're a fire. You know, you ought to keep that way in your life. That fire, that drive. Don't ever give it up. Because do you remember when you was first got in the war and you came up, you were just full of fire. You want to tell the world about how you feel about God. How do we drift away along past the time that we don't have that same fire? Keep that fire in you, that drive. Don't ever give it up. It's important. Because once you let that go, you start letting the world drift in little by little, changing your mind about the Lord. Keep that drive and that fire. 
that thirst, that righteousness in your heart. Don't let nothing ever get in your way. But you got your eyes focused on Christ. <coughs> and anything that you want to do, you can do it. If you want to teach, you want to practice, you want to teach the kids, you can do those things. That's what makes the church grow and make people want to stay. And they, they build on the Lord's words together. To hold the church together. Keep that thirst of God. He loves that. Philippians chapter 3 and 12 through 4, it says, Not as though I have already attained, either was already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehend of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's what we had. Stay on the mark. Stay on the mark. Keep pressing forward. Don't ever lose that thirst. Peter thought he had reached a level where he would never deny Jesus. But that very night he denied him three times. You know, when you ever, when you ever think that you're going to reach something that goal in life, you have already lost it. Because something's gonna happen, gonna throw you off. You're thinking, oh, I will never deny Jesus, or I will never say that I'm not a Christian. Get among about a thousand folks, and you're the only Christian there. What you gonna say then? You hold to, and you hold close the Lord. Don't ever change. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Christians never reach the point we are so mature that we can never fail. They never reach that point. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 12 says, Wherefore, let him think that he think he stand, take heed lest he fall. One of the main reasons Christians do not grow is that they do not see the need for growing. They do not see it. They have no desire to work and serve to full extent of their ability. They will never see that. I don't need to grow anywhere. I'm already there. Of course you are. You need to grow now because you're lying to yourself. We all need to grow. We all need to grow in the Lord. When people develop a burning hunger and thirst to work for the Lord, then they will develop the other steps they need to grow in their life. They would develop that. Do you have that burning desire in your life to work for the Lord? Ask yourself that. Do you have it? If you don't, get it. If you do, keep it. Too often the fire dies too soon in our life. So that's my sermon today. Is that we want to keep that thirst and that righteousness in our life. And don't ever let your children be raised without the Lord. Because that's our future. If you love yourself, you'll love your children, and you'll love the Lord. And you'll stay, keep on the righteousness, and you'll stay on the mark of the Lord. I thank you, church, for inviting me here. And I always appreciate the, the time that I have here. And I value that. Thank you for listening to me tonight. And thank you, Brother Marion. And I appreciate it. God bless.